Well, good afternoon. Kristen Collins here, once again, taking a pause to connect with very important people on my journey. And today I have the blessed opportunity to have a conversation with Reverend Sean Harvey. Hey, Sean. Hey, how are you? I, I can't say Reverend without like my shoulders moving. <laughs> I'm still getting used to it. <laughs> how many days has it been? Uh, what day is today? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I think it's a Thursday. <laughs> I, I got ordained a week ago. Uh, well, congratulations. And I want to take us back a little bit before that and then land on where we are here today. But what I'm doing during this global pandemic, um, as I've self-isolated for a lot of it, I've been very blessed that I've been able to. Um, it's made me very reflective on my journey. And as I try to articulate what it is that I'm feeling or what it is that I have to say, I'm finding that I'm in a really deep place of introspection. And I'm, I'm having challenges being able to articulate how I'm feeling or what it is that you know I have to say. So I was inspired um, once a week to connect with someone who's crossed my path and made it an impact. And you are by far a top 12 in my life. So thank you so much for taking about a half hour today to reminisce with me um, and really for me to express gratitude mm. to you for your divine beauty, your um, calm openness, your vibrant energy, and just you, you, you enveloped me without knowing me and became my brother immediately. Um, so I just wanted to start by expressing gratitude. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a joy. It's been a joy watching you in your own journey and your evolution and just... Um, your constant curiosity. That's such, see, right there. That's all I needed to hear because that's exactly the case, Sean. So I want to go back to the infamous weekend uh, that Cheryl and I came to New York on a purpose mission. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had thought I had found my answer in trying to find an online portal to help folks find their purpose quickly, efficiently, inexpensively, and all that good stuff. And uh, with high hopes, we flew to New York. And um, within an hour of being in the two-day training, I realized, unfortunately, that it actually wasn't the tool I was hoping for. It's a great tool, but it just wasn't what I was looking for because it was very purpose-oriented from an HR lens or what is your purpose at work? Right. And how are you connecting with people at work? And I respect that, but I'm not in the HR department, A. And B, my lens was, well, if we go deeper than that, and it's not just about who are you and what is your point, right. period, or in general, then I think work and play and home and family and, you know, it all becomes easier. We show up more authentically. So... Uh, I was pretty upset. I was really bummed out because it was quite an investment to be up there and, and participate. But there you were. <laughs> there you were. And I'm like, well, this isn't working for me, but there's something about this guy who just has this vibrancy. And at, this, at that time, which is about a year and a half ago already, can't believe it, um, you were going through a transformation. So I want to take us back to that time. And will you talk a little bit about when I met you, where you were at, and what was happening for you in your metamorphosing. Mm -hmm. so that feels like five lifetimes ago. <laughs> um, at least five different versions of the story. So at that moment, that time that I met you, I was the head of personal transformation and well-being for Eileen Fisher of the Fashion Company. And we were we had delivered, developed and delivered a program on personal, on purpose, personal transformation, um, and well-being and, and, and growth. And um, really the focus of that conversation was, you know, and my mass, my, I have a, a, a counseling degree with a focus on existential psychotherapy. So that the purpose and the meaning of life conversation has just been pervasive and that that deep draw to calling 
And at that point for me, um, and I think it was probably more of my development, my, my point in development, um, I was seeing, I was seeing at Eileen Fisher, the power of transformation that was happening for men based on the elevation of the feminine from a corporate culture that was based on feminine leadership. And so the healing that was happening for men, the transformation that was happening for men based on their exposure to feminine principles. So the principles of um, collaboration, the, the, the principles of authenticity, um, holding space for all voices, checking the ego at the door, tapping into creativity, you know, these sorts of things that were just manifesting because the culture allowed for it, because it created, as opposed to a data action-driven environment, a spaciousness of possibility and creativity. And a gen generosity of spirit of allowing people to be them, their true selves, and to come into a place of their wholeness. And so seeing that, I thought my journey at that point was to help men come into their, their wholeness. Um, and so at the end of, that was uh, probably October and then December, it was actually during that moment, that, that time with you all that I realized it was time for me to leave Eileen Fisher and start my own company. And so um, two months later, I left Eileen Fisher, started my company with a focus on asking three questions. One, what if more men had been exposed to the experience that the 200 of us at Eileen Fisher had been exposed to? What possibility would that create in the world? The second was what if we were able to truly create a gender balance? So kind of taking it out of even the gender equity conversation, if we are to balance the, the voices of, of men and women, and if we expand that to the voices across gender, and to expand the voices across the masculine and feminine energy within each of us, what might that do to our innovation and our creativity and the ways that we think about um, how do we solve complex challenges that are facing us today? And the third question I asked was, what if cis organizational systems were built no longer on a masculine model of doing business, but on an integrated model that balanced the masculine and the feminine? What could organizational systems and organizational structures and organizational cultures feel and look like? So those are the three questions that I started my business with. And as I, over the course of the last 15 months, um, I, 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 I focused on men and then I transitioned into gender balance and then really looked at this idea of leadership through the lens of the, the healthy masculine and feminine. But what I found, and also being in seminary throughout all of this, what I found is that when I started talking about the integration of the masculine and feminine, it was never about the masculine and feminine. It was never about gender. It was never about men. It was about these serving as gateways into the deeper conversations we need to have around accessing our deeper humanity. And our ability to integrate into our full selves and see the wholeness of others through a lens of compassion that would then allow for a different type of relating and a different type of connecting and a different type of possibility in the world. So this, this was really where I went. And so when COVID happened, I, I'm probably talking too much, but- No, 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 no. keep it coming. <laughs> and so when COVID happened, you know, I realized I, I've been a, a, a change management organization development um, facilitator for over 20 years. I was a college professor for 10 years teaching undergraduates and grad students how to be facilitators and how to be agents of change. And I realized that my community are the, the, the bridge builders, the change agents, the facilitators, and the soul inspired leaders of the world. And in order for us to create the type of systems change that the world is asking us to create, we need to really go from a mind-based approach tap into a heart-centered approach, but really go to a soul-inspired approach, which is going to tap us, let us, allow us to tap into a collective consciousness for us to then reimagine the systems in a way that are gonna be compassionate, inclusive, just, and elevate the voices of all, as opposed to um, being in the ways that they are where they, 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 they really elevate the voice of few, the voice of power, the voice of the privileged, 
and it also can be quite oppressive to those who don't fit into um, the dominant mainstream group. So how do we do that? How do we do that? <clears throat> so, you know, it's, um, I think, I think, you know, it goes back to probably every other conversation you have. It goes back to the inner work that we have to do. We start with the inner work. We start with our integration work. We start with our healing work. For me, it's, it's, it's how do we access the parts of ourselves that we've denied. And from that journey of accessing our full selves, accepting the parts of ourselves that we've rejected, we are, that are shame-based, um, and allowing those to come in with a, a sense of self-compassion, self-love. And through that, we're gonna open our hearts to others in a way that we take the judgments that we have of ourselves, we're gonna then take the judgment off of others so that we can really see them for who they are from a greater a place of uh, deeper compassion. And from that place of deeper compassion, then we can start to see each other in places of innovation. And then we can start to reimagine the systems um, when we are able to see each other soul to soul and connect soulfully. So I really think that where we are, when you think about the number of people that are doing coaching work, the number of people that are doing mindfulness, the number of people doing like all of these different practices and all these self, not just self-care practices, but spiritual practices that allow us to come into our deeper level of consciousness. And when we learn, we have facilitators who can hold space for us to move from the work we've done ourselves to the work that we can do together and the ways that we can play in the sandbox in new ways because we're seeing each other differently. I think this is where we're gonna start seeing the change. And when we get over our own egos to think that we are the saviors and we can solve, and we move to the place that we need each other and we are a connection of each other, that's when we can start to reimagine a new possibility. We can heal together and we can create a new sense of hope. I took away from one of your facilitation gatherings, I think it was two weeks ago, um, having the courage to show up with the right questions and not thinking you have to bring the right answers. Um, and I've used that for the past couple weeks all over the place that really resonated with me um, to that openness. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanna go back and, and if we had a blood pressure cuff on me right now, we would see just, how much you're lighting me up and articulating what I feel, but yet am new to understanding. Like you have, you have two decades of experience getting you to this point. Mine was a very unconscious journey to get me to this point. So part of the joy of me connecting like this is to hear people I admire and love articulating. I'm like, yes, what Sean said. Did everyone hear that? So I'm going to be hitting rewind on those few paragraphs about a bajillion times mm -hmm. but what I want to reflect on first is the divinity of and curiosity of being in New York <laughs> being super disappointed again did a lot of research it was an investment I dragged Cheryl with me like I thought I found the mountaintop and not finding it and instead of shutting down which often I would tend to do out of disappointment, I opened to the curiosity of, well, then why am I here? <laughs> what is the point of this? And there was some beautiful um, connectivity and, and, and um, birthings for Cheryl and I as friends, as colleagues, and then as individuals, but also the divinity of connecting with you. And it wasn't so much in New York, that trip that I connected with you and you were working with Cheryl. So that was a really cool connectivity there. But it was really after that as well, and staying connected with you. The highlight for me today, sitting in this moment, was your courage. Your just, I am going to follow my intuition, my inner guide, my inner knowing, and I'm going to jump. <laughs> Woo! You jumped. And the path wasn't clear, and it was a really big chance that you took on your knowing and i just want to take a moment to celebrate that and let you know how inspiring that is and for others to be aware of you did not have a, a safe path a clearly defined path um i had the pleasure of connecting with you 
nine, 10 months ago when I was up in New York and we grabbed some coffee together and you were just like, oh, please, I hope that this all lands soon because this has been really raw. So talk to me a little bit about that space. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. I think that's important. And, and yeah. there's a lot of, you know, I think that run of, of, of challenge and difficulty lasted about six months. And it was sitting in it, it was being in the fetal position. It was, um, you know, a seeing as a man the ways that I still hold on to, I've got this and I'll have to figure it out on my own. And, um, and the, the paralyzing effect that that, that, that that level of fear can have, you know? And so, there was actually, um, so that, that lasted about six months. And while I was in seminary and, and what happened, my, my, vo- my advice to so many people now is if you um, are in seminary or some spiritual program, never ever start a business while you're in it because the spiritual breakdown of that experience could derail your whole, your, your, your whole trajectory that you had envisioned. Yet in reality, um, it was exactly what was supposed to happen. Because I would not be able to be doing the work that I'm doing today in the way that I'm doing it without that experience. That breaking down, that cracking open the heart, that, that going to a connection of trust in the divine, trust in spirit, trust in the universe that things are going to be taken care of. Um, and so I'm doing it again. I'm, I'm actually on, on the breaking point of another major transition and, and stepping off the ledge into the unknown which is I'm, I'm going to be in New York for another week and then I'll be moving to Asheville, North Carolina. Um, partly because I was called and I just felt this my, from my inner gut, from my inner knowing, saying I need to be in, in, in Asheville for a number of reasons. And then um, a week ago, a friend of mine, it was about a week ago, a week and a half ago, a friend of mine sent me a video of um, Chief David Zach in uh, Asheville. Uh, the chief of police for the Asheville, Asheville Police Department. And he was basically, as we are in these times right now, of um, really experience, on the brink of a revolution of, of, of racial justice. Um, and that this feels and is very different than what's been in the past. And, and the hope is that this will continue so we can truly create the healing um, and the justice. And so Chief Zach um, put out there in a video that he's looking for um, members of the community who would be interested in being involved with police reform and reforming the, the police department in Asheville um, through breaking down the systemic and institutionalized racism, addressing it and looking at what will it take to create systemic change and potentially become a model for other police departments around the nation on how, as he put it, bringing the community back into community policing. And so I heard that call and I thought about my best friend who will not come to Asheville. He'll visit me in New York, but not in Asheville. He's from London. He's mixed race. And he said, Sean, I can't come to Asheville. I'm afraid your police will murder me. And I said to him, I can't give you any assurances that that's true. I can't give you assurances that that's safe. You'll be safe. And with that, I went to the chief of police and shared that and said, and for this reason, for, and for all of our black and brown brothers and sisters who share that fear that, um, I have to do this. And so um, um, I changed my trip from um, August to uh, next week to be able to, to start with the police force and be part of the task force. Um, and I don't know where it's gonna go. I don't know where anything's gonna go, but I just know that, um, as I say in a lot of moments these days, it's all about following the breadcrumbs. And I have in my calendar, Sean moves to Asheville August 31st, and I'm like, wait, next week, you're ahead of schedule. 
I'm glad. Now, now I know why and the divinity of, of that timing. I am elated, A, that you're halfway closer to me. Uh, now you're a car right away. I can come get you. But right. I am so elated watching you leave, you know, my favorite place on the planet, right, New York, um, to follow those breadcrumbs t to nature, uh, to a, 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 an incredible, from what I understand, an incredible community where you are very vibrant no matter where you are. But there is no doubt that this next chapter in Asheville uh, is going to be a whole new level. I have a, a specific question um, about following your breadcrumbs or following your knowing. Mm -hmm. So as you reflect on your life journey thus far, um, have you always followed your knowing? Mm -hmm. And if you have, then were there ever times that you were disconnected from following your Look at that curiosity at play. Those <laughs> questions, I love these questions. So when I was, so when I was 16, um, I had come out as a gay man when I was 15. My mother was very accepting and loving and open. And I was a precocious teenager and I found an activist in Dayton, Ohio, and I called him up and I said, hey, I want to volunteer. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work with gay and lesbian youth. And he said, well, there isn't anything that, that exists like that. And I said, well, I think there should be. And he said, well, if you would like the support, we will support you with space and financial resources to create this. And so at 16, I started a gay and lesbian youth group for the city of Dayton, Ohio. Now, back then, and you know, that was 1990. So that was gay and lesbian. Now it would be the LGBTQ um, community. And it still exists today, um, serving all of Southwest Ohio from Columbus, Cincinnati to the Indiana border. Um, and it serves about 80 youth at any one time. And my motivation was I was sneaking out to gay bars when I was 15, watching guys my age being taken advantage of by guys in their 20s and 30s. And I just thought um, there's got to be a safe space for us to be able to come out and build community. And so that was my motivation. And I think for me, when I see a need, then I'm like, okay, so then how do we, how do we address that? How is it serving? And it's usually from that observation. So over the course of my career, two things would typically happen. If I followed status, money, or a position, I would usually fall on my face within six to 12 months. When I would take a step back and actually listen to my inner voice, give myself space, and go back to what it was that I loved about launching the organization at 16. And I was literally creating mission and vision statements at 16 when I didn't even know what they were. And so um, when I go back to that and I go back to that place of how am I being of service? How am I getting out of my own ego and how am I getting out of my own narcissism to be able to be there in service of others? And usually that would define a very different path. So that's played out with Youth Quest, which was a group I started. It's played out with the, mo the, the college majors I've had. Um, so and my undergrad is in industrial psychology. My first master's is in organization development. And then my third is in, or my second master's is in um, counseling with a focus on existential psychotherapy. And then when I'm going into ministry. Um, and then it was also that knowing was when I went to work for Eileen Fisher. And so there were these moments and those are where there was longevity. That's where there, I was able to create an impact. That's where I was able to create something that had a lasting, it was, it was lasting, it was sustainable. And I think where I'm at right now is totally following those same breadcrumbs, that same way of thinking, that same way of saying, where is the need? And it's interesting because um, when people talk to me between last year and this year, and I talk about my vision. Last year, my vision was about integrating the masculine feminine. But people would say, when you talk about it from that perspective, it was very intellectual and it was very head. Mm -hmm. They're like, now when you talk, it's very heart. It's very love-based. And so I think the one thing I would offer is, if you have a concept and you don't have the audience in mind for the love that you want to share with them, then all you have is a concept, 
And you're probably going to be striving and figuring out and trying to intellectualize, rationalize your way into making that work. When you come from a place of love, the doors start to open and it becomes effortless. It becomes you are operating with a force beyond yourself. And from that place, I think then you create a different possibility. I didn't want to hug you. <laughs> oh, that is so awesome. It is so awesome. And it's interesting because I came from a place of knowing, but I didn't know I did, if that makes any sense. It was a very unconscious intuition because um, I didn't have a lot of, there wasn't a lot on me as far as pressure or responsibility. And I envied people who had like a plan, who were like, oh, this is going to be my professional career. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I was like, I don't know. I'm, I just kind of was going with the flow and it worked out really well, right? Can I offer? Uh huh. Can I offer to that? Please. So at Eileen Fisher, at Eileen Fisher, we had I'm from, at Eileen Fisher, we had a um Akashic reader. So we had an Akashic Records reader. She was available, she she was available to all employees. And so quarterly I would go and get my Akashic reading. And basically, for those who don't know what that is, it's the way I interpret it is um, we each have a soul DNA record. And the contract that we created with the universe, with spirit, before we came on to this human life form that we are. And the Akashic Reader will basically channel um, the messages from the spiritual guides and masters around your alignment to your own D soul DNA record. Are you in alignment? Are you out? And not necessarily fortune tellers, but someone who's actually just going to tell you where you are today. What do you need to be paying attention to? What do you need to be letting go of? And so our Akashic reader at Eileen Fisher said to me at one point, Sean, it's great that you have a vision and a plan. Now I want you to walk out of your masculine and walk into your feminine from a place of curiosity and wonderment and let go of the need to control the outcome. And for me, when I talk about the work of the masculine feminine, that was one of the easiest ways for me to understand it. And I think, and so I also want to just comment on what you've been sharing. I think most of us are operating from this place. When we're operating from intuition, we're following breadcrumbs. We don't, we don't necessarily name it. We don't necessarily have the vision. But at the end, there's a certain point when you realize all of these different seemingly haphazard moments in your life are actually building up to something for the impact that you're meant to create. And so you have to go through the struggle. You have to go through the exhilaration. You have to go through the, the moments of, of, of loneliness, the moments of sloth to be able to, and, and the not knowing, to be able to, one, understand the experience of the human condition. And then from that place, you can, you can then have empathy and compassion for others and for yourself. And so as we're all trying to figure out how to navigate this landscape, it's those experiences that allow us to be guides. It's those experiences that allow us to be guided. It's allow those, those, come, those experiences that allow us to be in our humility. And those experiences allow us to feel the full range of the human experience. And so I think that, um, you know, as you start to think about, I didn't have this or I didn't do this or I didn't know this. Um, you know, that's, I think we're, we're connecting back in. Someone else did know. Someone else was guiding you. You were having what you needed for what you needed. And you're having the experience that you need for the work that you're meant to do and bring into the world. So I would encourage anyone who is thinking about <clears throat> the ways that their life might, might not be measuring up. There might be something in those experiences of not measuring up or there's something in those experiences of the hardship or the what feels like it's impossible that um, maybe where you're going to be off, able to offer that, that sense of hope, inspiration, compassion for someone else going along the journey or to start to uh, visualize and articulate what a vision could be to create the support and help that's needed in our world for the transformation and healing that we need, especially right now in this moment. So, so beautiful. And 
speaking of what's going on in this world in this moment when i've connected with some other folks i've asked um as i kind of was landing the plane bringing to this present moment and talking about how the global pandemic has affected um but i what's cool about our conversation is that that has been in my opinion woven throughout this this chat so instead of asking that question to you in in as we come to conclusion I would love um, to explore with you your uh, move next week, but more holistically, and I know this can all change because it's I'm watching you transform and change like every time I connect with you, it's, there's something new, there's something different, um, but your short-term vision for your offerings, your new company, um, how you are leading leaders to facilitate from a place of whole and self-love and, and, and soulfulness. Um, speak a little bit about your offerings right now, because if there is anyone besides me who's already plugged in that wants to plug in with you and be a part of your transformational work, I'd like them to better understand what you're going to be doing as you head to Asheville. So... What I'm, what I'm starting to offer, I'm actually what, what launched this week. Um, when I was putting together the calendar for Facilitator Edge, um, I thought, I, I realized that when I was being ordained, we wouldn't have a session. And I had been thinking about this topic of soulful facilitation, tapping into spirituality as facilitators, as bridge builders, as change makers. Um, because I'm in, I've been, privileged to be in so many conversations with leaders with mindfulness leaders with teachers who are spiritually driven are, are, are deeply ingrained in their spiritual practices and don't necessarily always know how to be the translators or don't necessarily feel the permission to be able to bring their full selves including their spiritual self into the space especially in corporate spaces Yet I was hearing so many of these people and I was seeing their spirit, I was seeing their soul, I was seeing their, their beauty and I was seeing their gifts. And I was like, what if we just created a space with permission to talk about this so you don't feel like you're so alone? And so I launched, uh, this, uh, um, so for the, the, the Tuesday of the Facilitator Edge program, this week, which was this week, after being ordained, I thought this would be the perfect time to create soulful facilitation. And so we we launched it, and we had our roundtable on it. Um, normally, we have about twenty people in any Facilitator Edge conversation. I don't know how this happened, but we had one hundred and forty six people register, and we had nine up to one hundred and three people on the call. You know how that happened because it was supposed to go. <laughs> and I was struck. I was really, I, but, but it, the Friday, the, mo the Monday before our session, I went to bed. We had 85 people registered and I knew most of the people. I woke up the next morning and we had 122. And then the numbers just kept going up until we had 146 people registered. And watching 103 down to about, and then averaging about 92 people seeing what was emerging because these folks were just having the space to speak their truth and to speak their truth from a deep, a, a deep sense of wisdom and a deep sense of knowing without the ego and without the fear of not having permission. And so it was an unfiltered conversation of truth. And I think from that place, it was like, wow, we need to keep this conversation going. And not that we need to have 100 people on the call every week, but to have a conversation every week where people have access to a community of people that are like-minded or that are, are on the path of seeking, exploring, or learning. And just being a seeker to explore deeper. Where's the space for that? And I think so many people come to the work of facilitation and the work of coaching, the work of organization development, and the work of being a change agent and then come into a corporate space and then it's beaten out of them. And it's, it's, it's regimented, it's, it's constructed, it is often artificial and it's often performative. Not always, but there's often that urge that, that there's that impulse and that pressure to conform to the norm. 
I think this is a conversation that says, bring your authentic self to the conversation, bring your whole self and allow yourself just to explore in the, in the curiosity of the question and the mystery of the unknowing and allow for that as opposed to always having to have the answer, the right thing to say, the right thing to do or the, or the right way of looking. And I think if we can release ourselves from that, we can come to this place of authentic connection that we can bring into the space, we can bring into the room, and then we can give permission to those in the spaces that we're trying to, to form safe and brave space so that we can actually create the transformation in the world that we need to make, or the transformation in our organizations we need to make, so that all voices are heard, so that we can innovate, we can solve increasingly complex challenges that are feeling like there's fewer and fewer answers. How do we tap into a deeper level of creativity and a deeper access to innovation so that we can solve those problems differently and break the mold, the ways that our systems have asked us to build them. So I think from that place, um, and I forgot what the question is, I'm just It doesn't matter, keep going. <laughs> um, but I think from that place, we have an opportunity to um, start to, to reimagine a, poly, a, a possibility together. I think we have to also get real with the harms that have been created over the course of our nation and the harms that are being created around the world um, through violence, through murder, through injustice, through subjugation. Um, and that we then need to be on a path of reconciliation and healing. So that from that place, then we can come to really creating these systems with integrity really creating these spaces where all voices are heard and that those of us that have power and privilege that we're using that power and privilege as a way to elevate those voices represent those voices not speak for those voices and not tell their stories but to give space so that all voices can come into the space wow <laughs> I so cherish you. Um, I am so beyond words that I have crossed with you and that we've remained in touch. And you are one of the tw top 12 people who have completely blown up my life in such a positive way. And I think from this connectivity, I know that we've only just begun. <laughs> um, your walk is so real and it is so beautiful, and it is so inspiring, and I don't feel alone. <laughs> I have felt very alone for the past couple of years, and with connecting with you from your whole, healed, accepting, loving being, um, my core is rocked. So thank you for being you, loving you, accepting you, taking chances on you um, and you're inspiring me to do the same. <laughs> I'm right behind you. <laughs> I'm just chasing you like a little puppy dog. I'm like, I'm coming, Sean, give me a few more months. Um, if folks wanted to plug in with your awesomeness, uh, what is the best way to connect with you? That's what you were asking about. I forgot the question. You want to know what my offerings are. Better answer than what than that. We could always type in your email or something. <laughs> So, um, so my, I, I want to just share two things. I want to share my vision. So my vision for moving to, so, so now my vision, my North Star, and what has been my drive for the last eight years was to create a leadership institute for global compassion and healing. A space for the change agents, the change makers, the soul-inspired leaders, the facilitators and the bridge builders to come together from around the world. These days it might be virtually, but if there's a space, it's gonna be in Asheville or subsets of Asheville around the world where we do our, it's basically we do our inner work. We do our integration work. We do our leadership development work, but, but to redefining the model of leadership that goes from a control and fear-based model to an empowered, model based on command and really allowing people to come into their full power and hear each other in their full power. And then moving to this place of authentic connection, but this authentic connection from the place of we see each other soul to soul, not just human to human, 
and we get rid of the labels and we get rid of the ways that we see difference. And I know that that's ideal. And I know people are going to say, Sean, but we are, this is our reality. I think right now we're working on those realities that are going to create. And I think there's so many people that are involved in the work around race, around gender, around um, religion, around ability and, and, and disability and around the different ways that we are different and, and moving it from how do we move from those, like to talk about the realities for the healing across difference, the connection and the compassion that's going to allow us to build bridges, to hear each other as that work is being done and then soulfully say, so how do I see you as a soul brother, as a soul sister, as a soul day? In order for us to... I'm getting emotional. <laughs> and so in order for us to be able to build that community and then from that place to come into a place of reimagining possibility, reimagining, how do we then redefine, not even, not even redefine, rebuild the systems, the structures and the cultures in a way. So I think that's, that's the goal. That's the North Star. Creating a space for that. The work now is building the foundational architecture for that. And that starts with soulful facilitators. And so the way to reach me is at soulfulfacilitator.com. It made it very easy. <laughs> um, as opposed to people trying to figure out how to say symponia. Now, symponia, which is the name of my company, is actually the Greek word for compassion. So essentially it was compassion consulting. But now taking it to the next level, soulful facilitator. Each of us has the potential to be a soulful facilitator. I think the model of leadership is gonna to move to a model of soul-inspired facilitation. When we get out of the way, we get out of our egos, and we allow for the space to be created with our guidance and with our presence, but not with our expertise, not with our letting people know how smart we are, and but really letting people see who we are how big our hearts are and how much we bring love into the space for each person and each, each voice. I think that's going to be the way. I think you know, one of the things that when I started Symphonia, it was based on the fact that I saw so little compassion in our organizations and our government and our healthcare system. I think now as we look at what's happened with the pandemic, we're seeing so many cracks in the systems that are just, we don't have humane systems. We don't have systems that really hold our humanity, that are based in our humanity and that allow for people to be taken care of. And that's not socialism, that's just common human decency. That we actually think about that as opposed to thinking about metrics, numbers, or, day, or dollars or political correctness or what's on, where we are on the political aisle or spectrum and ideology. And I think then from that place, as soulful facilitators, you know, what I'm offering is now we have the facilitator edge conversations that happen every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. Those are topic specific conversations. The flip side of it is on Thursdays, we now have what I call Soulful Facilitation Deep Dives, which is where we come together and the conversation is created based on the time, the times we're in, the conversations that need to be had and allowing spirit to be in the space to allow our collective consciousness to figure out through our collective wisdom what we need to be talking about. And then um, I'm, I'm launching a pilot at the end of the month on June 30th called the Soulful Facilitator 10-Week Intensive. And this is really a gateway um, offering that, that brings us into a set of modalities and a set of conversations and topics that are different than most facilitator trainings that really allow us to hold the sacred space and learn how to hold sacred space for the conversations that are going to transform and the conversations that are going to heal. And I think so many of us right now are seeing the need and feeling the need from the world that we're in. And flip side of it, we're also feeling the call to do something more than we're doing now. And so this is really creating a space for the next level, for the experienced facilitator to be able to come into it, 
to give access to those who are new or establishing themselves as facilitators to have other bridge steps to then come into a soulful facilitator conversation. So, but at the end of the day, as much as we talk about good leadership and as much as we talk about good coaching, we don't talk enough about good facilitation. And it's the space holders that I think are gonna be where we see the innovation, the bridge building and the love for each other as we think about a new possibility together. Amen. And I'm in for all of it. <laughs> and what you, I think I can speak for myself. I called it servant leadership because I didn't know how, again, this exercise is to help me better understand and to articulate. <laughs> and you just articulated it. And there's many people that I'm crossing with that are like, they have that, uh, like, but they don't have the answer on how to move forward. They, and what you've just provided is that reflection and that clarity of what I'm feeling, but I don't know how to say. Mm -hmm. And one of my takeaways from being in your Tuesday gathering was being a, a servant leader actually requires you to be really quiet. <laughs> and it's not that you have all the answers. And I have really taken my foot off the gas when I am holding space to try to allow the group to come with their full essence and being and be heard. And I am beyond grateful that you are offering the tools to help me grow in my facilitation from my place of spirit and wholeness and health and healing um, to help others connect with theirs. So your, your fateful crossing um, almost two years ago is now becoming clear to me. Mm. And I know that our journey together is just going to be so inspiring and, and satiating and fulfilling for me and many, many others. So thank you for taking some time today to reflect and, and share. Um, and I know that you will continue to shed light and guide and help transform the globe. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Much love. And safe move. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.